Im nun folgenden Video beschreibt Geraldine Fitzpatrick verschiedene Technologien, die entwickelt wurden, um die Pflege von Menschen zu Hause zu unterstützen. Sie können sich denken, dass es hier in den letzten Jahren zahlreiche Entwicklungen gegeben hat. Von Telecare und verschiedensten Apps für Smartphones und Tablets über Smart Homes und Wearable Technology, die am Körper getragen wird, bis hin zu Pflegerobotern. Trotz der Verfügbarkeit dieser Technologien sowie zahlreicher Forschungsprojekte zu deren Einsatz werden sie weiterhin sehr wenig und oft eher erfolglos in Pflegekontexten eingesetzt. Das hängt auch mit den Ängsten und Befürchtungen der pflegebedürftigen Menschen zusammen. Warum dieser Zusammenhang wichtig ist, wird uns Geraldine Fitzpatrick jetzt erklären. So we've talked about people living longer and more likely to be living with chronic health conditions and that technology can be seen as a key way to help deal with the consequent challenges of caring for people. So we're going to look here at what technologies are being developed or are currently available to support more what we'll call more formal care arrangements for an aging population. And to focus this, we're going to look at care in the home. So what sorts of technologies then are being developed uh, with a particular view for older people and care at home? Well, for a start, You may have heard all sorts of different labels again for this. It could be ambient and assisted living or active and assistive living or a smart home or telecare. Again, we're not going to worry too much about labels, but just to give a flavour of the sorts of technologies. So one class of these technologies could be what we call wearable technologies. So that could be a fall detector that I wear as a pendant around my neck that detects if I've fallen over or increasingly a smartwatch uh, that might detect if they think I've had a fall and also capture other data like heart rate or my step count or my location. And there's a, another bunch of sensors that are more to do with safety and security. So examples of these might be a smoke detector or a gas detector in the kitchen. And this could be especially useful for people with memory problems who may forget to turn off the stove when, when they've been cooking. Or uh, another example of a safety security device could be a pressure mat under the mattress. And so when someone gets up at, in the middle of the night who may be at risk of fall, uh, there can be some smart algorithm that will send an alarm if the person isn't back in bed within some expected time. Or it could also be a smart light that turns on when they get up uh, in the middle of the night, you know, and the smart light detects movement and again decreases the risk of falls. Then there's another bunch of technologies that are to do with various sensors and monitoring devices that monitor what we would call activities of daily living. So we could imagine having sensors in every room that detect movement and they would know what room people are in, how long they've been there, if they're moving around or not. Uh, they could learn what's your normal routine, whether you've normally made your cup of tea by, the, by nine o'clock when you normally do it or not. And send out alerts then again if they detect deviations from these normal patterns that they detect. Uh, also with daily living devices, we can think of you know, smart devices that might in, encourage healthy eating or measuring your water intake, if you're drinking enough water, a smart cup, or uh, if you're going out for walks, a smart walking cane. And then there's another class of devices that we could say are concerned with more of the medical aspects of care. And this could be having a, a blood pressure machine or a lung function testing device and the person would take their own measurements at home and then these would get uploaded automatically to the doctors to be monitored. Or it could be a smart pill bottle that uh, sends reminders to take the medication or automatically reorders the medication as you're running out. And increasingly with more recent packages, we're seeing more devices being included that support communication and connection with people. And this includes the video conferencing that we talked about in the first chapter that enables people to have their medical consultations with their doctor or their nurse. And also more recently, 
uh, communication apps are often included on the tablets that the tablets that are connecting with the doctors to send the blood pressure machine also enable people to connect with friends or to find free time activities and so on. And an example of this in Vienna has been the recent Volta project, which uh, put a lot of these technologies into homes. And uh, if we're looking in at more of the future, we're also seeing many more experiments with robots for care in the home. So, you know, like a humanoid robot called Pepper that might help pick stuff up for people who maybe have trouble moving or these soft, cuddly, seal-like robot that provides more social support. So lots of technologies are available. And where are we at with these? Well, like the telemedicine story, there's been very active research and development around them for a very long time. Uh, again, in the 1990s in a research centre that I was involved with, there was a group there who were already working on 3D accelerometer devices as pendants to detect falls. And they were being able to detect the difference between someone just falling like this, which might be some, a brain aneurysm event, or falling like this where they've tripped. And that would make a difference to the, to the level of alert that you would raise. Uh, there was another group in this research centre in the 1990s who were already installing you know, a clunky old PC with a blood pressure machine and lung checking device in people's home, in pilot studies in people's homes. And again, since the 1990s, there's been increasingly sophisticated development of these systems, and we can see the, the advancing generations of systems that have got increasingly smarter. And again, unsurprisingly, there's been a huge amount of money and time and effort uh, in national and industry initiatives. And uh, also, for example, the EU has a big funding program called the AAL that's been in place since 2008. And they've spent 700 million euros on over 300 projects. And with the explicit aim of developing new products and services and getting them through to actual trials in use and, and commercialization. So all this work, how successful have all these systems and projects been then? The bottom line is not very. Even though we have the technologies per se, they're really not being taken up from pilot study into more widespread practical use. On the one hand, it is surprising given how long we've been working on the problem and how good the technologies are in their core functionalities. And given all of the pilot projects we've had. But on the other hand, we're seeing yet again that designing good technologies that actually fit into everyday context and that people want to use and can use is much more than a technical problem. Just as we saw with telemedicine that we talked about in the first chapter. We're also not seeing strong outcome results when we do put these uh, technologies into pilot projects either, when people are using them. So again, I would point to the Volta project here in Vienna, um, where they actually ran a, a rigorous randomised control trial over 12 months with 150 people in Vienna, putting the technologies into the homes of people in the experimental group. And they found no significant effects. And their findings reflect the findings from many other studies that have either no effects or very mixed findings, mixed effects. Again, what might be the reasons for this? Like video conferencing um, for telemedicine, it's complicated at all sorts of levels, all sorts of levels. So for older people themselves, one of their big concerns is that they're going to become prisoners in their own home, that these technologies are going to replace human care, that the nurse isn't going to come in to visit them anymore. They're concerned about having technologies, some people are concerned about having technologies in the home that are grey boxes that don't look very attractive. One of our participants said, I don't want my home looking like a hospital. And while the healthcare system might think these technologies are meeting real needs, for many of the older people, they're not meeting their real needs or they find them stig stigmatising or patronising, they're stigmatising to wear a pendant device or patronising to think that they need a walking stick. You know, 
Um, many of us will have those stories from our grandparents. So they often, these devices, while they might get installed, they're also often just abandoned or turned off or people get very creative at doing some workarounds. And I will point you to a video that's a wonderful example of well-intentioned devices that totally miss the mark. And another really telling point is in studies that have been done on the call centres that monitor uh, the alarm systems connected with these devices, what do you think is the category of calls that's the highest? Well, it's false alarms is what they label it. But when the researchers have gone and talked to the people working in the call centre, they're not false alarms. Many times, most times, they're the older people deliberately triggering their device to generate alert because they're lonely and they just want to talk to someone because they know if they trigger an alert, they'll get a call from the call centre. And the people in the call centre would get to know them and, and know that they would expect Mr Smith to always trigger the device sometime in the morning. And so it's not surprising that a comment that we would get often when we ran these pilot studies was, um, even though there were people like Jim who totally fitted the profile, they'd say, oh, that's not for me if we offered them to be able to keep it. Give it to an older person who needs it. So we're missing the mark. We also have lots of issues with, the, again, the, the healthcare professionals, the doctors and nurses, similar to video conferencing, and the institutional aspects around um, you know, the, who installs and monitors and the new workflows and procedures and policies and new ways of working and new skills and training. We won't go into those details here. But you can see that they're complex issues. So what could more responsible and accountable approaches to technology for older people and care be about then? We'll pick up on this in the next chapter. <laughs>